Hi, everyone. Sorry about the technical glitch. Uh, we're back. And uh, I believe that when we got interrupted by the Hangout hanging up on us, we were uh, talking to Josie. And Josie, are you there still? Hi, Josie. Can you hear us? Yes, I can now. Great. So I realize that this there has been a long pause now, but I'm wondering if you would be willing to pick up where you left off, uh, in which uh, I think it was a cliffhanger. You were saying no, I was building the barriers tension. are. Right, exactly. <laughs> so one of the things that um, as, as we found is that although we've got actually really, really high levels of practitioners working in schools, who are very, very confident with a range of technologies, two of our areas that we look at, which are um, around communication and collaboration and around creating and sharing uh, resources, which is uh, particularly in terms of creating and sharing resources, very, very common things that educators do all the time. The scores in those areas for our staff were lower than we would have expected. And part of the reason for that is that we explicitly ask questions around things like, do you openly license your um, work? Do you use things like Creative Commons licensing? Do you know what open education resources were? And the big message that can, that's come back to us is that a lot of educators are actually at the beginning of their journey in the school sector in understanding and engaging with those kinds of open education ideas. So at the moment, one of the things that we're doing to address that, which is obviously a huge barrier because how can you engage with and share and get the benefit of all of this amazing um, work that's being create, um, created and shared by educators internationally? How can you get the benefit of that if you don't know anything about things like Creative Commons licensing? Um, it's very, very hard to uh, find and connect and make use of it. So one of the things that we're doing to address that, particularly at the moment, is a piece of work where we're creating um, resources and information for staff that are very, very entry level, that are very um, easy to understand and very introductory to be able to get people through that initial hurdle. Another um, barrier, I think, um, is around terms of service for people who are working in the education sector. Now, not uncommon to every other uh, kind of workforce sector, the ownership of people who create things within a school's workforce isn't actually theirs. It belongs to their employer. So there are there are obviously some um, people who have contracts who have specific agreements around ownership of their own work, and there are also arrangements that can be made. But the default in that is the same kind of thing. In the UK, um, I'm guessing that it's pretty similar in the US, uh, but the default is the same kind of scenario that you talked about when you introduced Creative Commons, that the default is that these works are not necessarily owned by you, they're under a copyright that somebody else owns. So kind of having that conversation in the school space, especially in the school policy space, is really, really important in terms of enabling educators and school leaders to know about uh, things like Creative Commons license and make use of it to promote their schools, to connect their schools to the outside world and to share the, the things that they're doing. Interestingly, students own their own work within schools, um, unlike most employers. Um, but that work tends to be used by staff much more than it is licensed and put out. So I think there's some really, really interesting issues and problems around Creative Commons license. And I think it's a really, really exciting time to start moving forward in the school space around these areas. I'm wondering if um, Josie's remarks uh, resonate with you, Alan, or Jane, um, or it looks like we have a new guest on, Carol, uh, and, and you'd like to jump in um, to just either echo what Josie is saying or um, add to what she has just said. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, Carol. Okay. Okay. I teach online for a community college. I teach library technical assistance, and I developed my courses and teach my courses. And um, I also teach copyright and Creative Commons. So uh, I'm ever mindful that the university owns my 
the, the courses that I have created. So uh, there are certain topics that uh, in, in social media and educational tech, di digital literacy that they're not interested in. And so, you know, I've had conversations with them about developing courses and they stated, no, we don't want these courses. So my dilemma is, you know, if I go out and just do a MOOC or just do whatever, you know, and, but I'm still employed by the university um, and, and getting some training from the university in these areas, you know, who, who owns that content? I feel like I'm really in the gray area. Um, so actually, I want to say that the Education Wing of Creative Commons about five years ago started carrying out some research on the different policies by universities of who owns what, um, and it really, within the United States anyway, and even around the world, it really varied. Um, each university or each institution had different policy, um, intellectual property policy for um, who owned the creation of educational resources at that institution. So I'm sorry that I can't give you a blanket answer. I think you'd have to check within your institution policy. In terms of K-12 schools, Paul might know more um, about the policies within those schools, but I have a feeling that they vary widely as well, even within the district, even within different states within the United States, and especially around the world. And I think it's just each individual policy, you'd have to get clearance for whatever you're creating if you want to be able to CC license it. I'm actually very surprised to hear from Josie that um, students in the UK retain the rights to the work. Is this true, Josie, even if um, they're minors, like under 13 years old or whatever the law is? Yeah, we have we have slightly different um, laws in terms of minors to the US. So for you, things like data um, the data protection is very specific to age groups, which is why you have COPA and all of those other things. In the UK, we have the data protection law, which actually protects everybody equally, whatever age they are. So we don't have some of the same issues around that. In relation to copyright, um, it, I'd be surprised if it wasn't similar. In, in terms of the production of materials. So I think things like um, exam scripts, for example, although I don't know who really wants to share their exam scripts with the world, I think the copyright around those specific things are different. But I think in terms of just general work that's produced in, the, in, the, in, in terms of being a student, um, the student retains that because they're not actually an employee. And, and I would be surprised if that wasn't similar to the US, but I think why that's interesting is because it's something that nobody really knows about and nobody really talks about. It's a really, really interesting area, I think, in, in terms of how do we make use of that, how do we take that forward. Also, given that, uh, as you've talked about, there are issues with institutions, and I think the university sector is a particularly tough one because you do have to make sure you have agreements and put in place specifically things. And policy work at university level is much harder to change, I think, than schools and smaller organisations who are, can be a bit more agile in their policy and can look at instituting things like use of Creative Commons uh, a little bit quicker. Um, but I think that the, um, so it, it is worth though really addressing those kind of things at that level. And I think at university level, a bit trickier, at school level, really worth having those conversations with your school leadership about what do you think about open licensing? How can we um, use open licensing to enhance our school, whole school community? Could we adopt any Creative Commons licensing, open licensing policies, for example? I think these are really interesting conversations that we could be having now. Um, one of the things that we do in uh, Leicester in the UK to support that is uh, we run a project with schools where we support uh, school-based work around a huge variety of areas. And one of the conditions of that is that they have to, and their head teachers and their schools have to agree to uh, put those um, the, the things that they create through their projects, which might be um, blog posts, they might be resources, they might be a range of other things. They have to Creative Commons license those in order to qualify for um, our support. We kind of uh, use it as a way of sharing and celebrating the work that we're doing, but also educating people about what creative license is. Because for some of those people, it's the first time they've come across it, and they're obviously like, oh, I'd better find out a little bit more about what that means and what the implications of that are. Um, so it's working out very well for us taking that reasonably hard line approach here. 
and not to go on too long, sorry, but another thing that I think is really, really important, I work in the public sector. We use public funding um, to fund our things. It's a really important argument, I think, that if you are publicly funding materials, they should be out and free for people to use. I think, I think it's a, a very strong uh, moral and economic issue, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. I want to pick up on one thread, um, Josie, this idea of, of, uh, of, of exposing educators, for instance, to even just the, the notion that open um, educational resources exist or that open licensing is an option. Um, and I'd be curious to hear from Alan because I recently had an experience in which working with a group of teachers, uh, they were completely unaware of Creative Commons, which may or may not you know, be surprising. but. What was interesting, though, was was engaging in the conversation with them. I think this is this was your point, Josie. But engaging in the conversation with them about the difference between copyright and Creative Commons. I think the notion that they would have some agency over being able to license their work, um, and that there are particular levels um, that they could use to license their work, was really eye-opening for them. And I think they also clung to notions of copyright that had to do less with the kinds of arguments you're making and more uh, this notion of ownership. So if I put my work out there, um, you know, how will I get credit in, 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 you know, or not even credit, but like, will my work be reused in a way that is not how I want it to be reused? You know, it's essentially the fear of putting work into the um, open space. And so, uh, so that was an experience that I had recently with a group of teachers in Oakland. And I'm wondering, Alan, since you work with a lot of educators um, here in the U.S., uh, if you're finding the same thing as you introduce um, ideas of Creative Commons. Um, I mean, it certainly does not surprise me that educators aren't aware of Creative Commons and aren't aware of the rules of copyright. Um, I mean, one of the biggest things, we're a media literacy organization, we're an activist organization, and fair use is a huge part of what we do. Um, I mean, I, I work dr more directly with the students than the educators. I mean, we do, do some professional development with educators. but um, So one of the big projects that we do in um, classrooms is having students talk directly to existing media um, by like critically remixing it. So they'll, they'll work with commercials or TV clips or music videos, um, pieces of media that aren't necessarily Creative Commons licensed. Um, and this, this goes to what Josie was talking about it with the students owning their, um, their work. So if, if we have a student critically remix um, a music video or something that's not creative, from Creative Commons licensed, um, what we like to do is then put it back up on YouTube. So say if they sourced it from YouTube, we'll put it back up on YouTube, their critical remix of it, and tag it the same way that the original was tagged. So if someone does a search um, for YouTube for that original commercial, they'll also find the student's critical remix of that. Um, but we have to then protect the students from backlash, obviously, because um, a company will come after that and try to get it removed. Um, so we actually we take on this, the rights of that so the students will give us their, their rights so we can protect them because we have lawyers to do that. Um, didn't really answer your question, but um, I guess it doesn't surprise me. Um, I mean, awareness is, awareness is huge. So, I mean, any program that we do, we certainly encourage the, the educators, um, the teachers, to be involved in that. And fair use is something that we always talk about in all, all the programs, even if they're not critically remixing media. Um, and then we, we try to use Creative Commons to supplement those, those projects that the students are using. So exposing the students and also exposing the educators to that too. And hopefully uh, when we're gone, they can take that back into their classroom setting. Yeah, no, I appreciate the fact that you brought um, the young people who uh, we work with into this conversation. I think we really did want to get there. And, and so uh, I'm curious, uh, and I also want to, uh, leave time for Jane too to ask any questions about this, um, but I, I, uh, or anyone actually. Um, but I'm curious. So when you are working with young people and you are uh, putting forward ideas related to Creative Commons, uh, how are they? How do they receive those ideas? Is, is it something that is intuitive to them, or is it something that um, you know requires you to do uh, a lot of work with them around? Um, I, mean, I think the I think the notion of copyright is is somewhat intuitive to students. I mean, they're, they're aware of it, obviously, with music sharing, and um, they're, they're so used to, to being online and coming across the things like that. I think it's intuitive. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think where it becomes tricky is, like, is getting them to under, be aware of the rights that they actually have when it comes to copyright, because I think um, 
big media companies are always going to lean on that lean on ownership rights, right? Like we own this, you can't touch it, or you can do certain things. So making students aware and teachers aware that they actually have rights when it comes to that stuff. So I think when it comes to Creative Commons, it makes it easy because then you can actually see what rights you have. Um, I mean, that's the greatest thing about Creative Commons. Um, yeah. I have a question for Alan. Um, have you found that in the process of teaching Creative Commons to the kids, it's kind of an easy or, or a good segue into teaching them about um, how to manage their rights online or about copyright or fair use? Um, yeah, I think creative, using Creative Commons as a, as a way to, as a bridge from copyright into fair use is a great tool because you can actually go through and like take a, take a, a work and see, oh, is this, uh, do they have attribution rights? Like wh what the different rights are, right? So you can go from the, from the easily, easily accessible piece of work to the one that's very protected, right? So you can see all the different, different um, rules that are guiding copyright and see where you, you as a user can come in. Right, but I'm, I guess I'm asking the question more from the perspective of um, students as creators. Um, if, yeah. if any of you on this call have, has done an activity with students where they go through the process of choosing a license for their own work and whether that's been an eye-opening experience for them. I, I, I have not done that because, um, like I said, most of the stuff that our students are creating are... Um, either original pieces of work or it's something that's not Creative Commons. They're using media that's not Creative Commons. Um, so we would have to protect them from that. So I haven't gone through the process of having them create their own, although that would be a good exercise, I think. Well, I, I will say, Jane, that so I'm not in the classroom and I'm not working directly with young people, but um, but we, I have gone through that process with, um, with adults, you know, with educators. Um, so going back to, uh, you know, what I was um, talking about originally, and I think it is very much an eye-opening process. I think this notion that um, that uh, people have well, so particularly for for educators, because I think like like Alan is saying that there is familiarity with copyright, um, and I think in fact teachers live in you know huge fear of copyright. Uh, you know, it's beaten into them this notion that that if they uh, if they somehow um, uh, uh, infringe upon copyright, you know that that they'll be jailed. Forever <laughs> is is kind of the message that you know ed educators often get. So I think it is hugely eye opening um, for educators to see that they that they have agency, that they have uh, the right to make choices about the licensing of their work. Um, you know, within the parameters of as Josie was talking about, who actually owns the work. Um, and I think it often what I've seen is it, it can motivate them and spur them on to begin to have those kinds of conversations with the young people they work with because um, for the reasons that Alan was talking about, um, you know, young people are um, creating uh, media content that they're putting up online. Uh, so they need to be really cognizant of this notion of what license they're going to attach to that uh, piece of work um, or how they, how they want to share that piece of work. Um, I'm wondering, actually, if this would be a good segue into uh, because you you uh, you um, held off on really getting deeply into all the various licenses. I don't know if this would be a good moment to actually think about. You know, so what 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 do the various um, components of the licenses mean, and what do the various licenses um, stand for or represent? Yeah, sure. So I can just go over basically um, again. Um, if we could look at the, um, let me just share my screen again. <laughs> okay. So if we go back to the licenses chart here, um, so you can see, I would ignore the public domain dedication at the top for now, but you can see that there are six different licenses displayed, and they kind of run from a spectrum. Um, for, of most open to least open. And so we offer these six different license options because every creator has different needs for how they want to share their work and how they want their work to be used. So if we imagine a situation, let's say, um, why don't we just pick someone in this Hangout? Um, so Josie, uh, what is like the last piece of content that you created um, that you wanted to share with folks on the web? I don't know if Josie can is still on or can hear me. 
Should make or Alan, maybe maybe we should. Sure, um, yeah. photograph. A photograph. So, photograph. yeah. Mm -hmm. And what were you? What would you be using the photograph for? Um, I mean, for personal use, but um, I guess I, if I wanted to, I could um, I could um, sell them. Uh huh. And what 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 is this photograph of? Let's just get specific. Did you take okay. a photograph uh, of your cat um, or your dog? <laughs> uh, travel photography. Travel photography. So you were traveling, you were having a nice vacation, let's say in Hawaii, you took a picture of the beach, and you wanted to share this photo with maybe your friends and family in the broader world, but you it was mainly really for personal use, and you don't want other people to sell your work. So if you go back to the, um, the license, the different licenses, um, you can kind of choose. So all of the licenses have the attribution condition, so that means that no matter who will use your photo, they, um, they will give you credit for the photo, and that's something you still want, right? You want people to be able to give you credit for the photo? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and then, in addition, you said you don't want people to sell your work? Yes. You would want to reserve commercial rights. So then, only you would choose from the remaining three licenses at the bottom of this graphic, um, which is the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial, or the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike, or the Non-Commercial No Derivatives. So maybe starting with the bottom license, are you okay with people remixing your work? Yes. Say, making a black and white version? Okay, great. So then we've rolled out the bottom license, and we have the two um, licenses up from the top. Um, now I guess the question is whether you want to add the Share Alike option, and that means if people do change your work and make a black and white version or remix it in some other way, do you want them to license it under the same terms, or are you okay with them licensing the derivative however they like? Um, I mean, I guess if I wanted to reserve um, reserve commercial rights, I would probably want to protect protect it from the derivatives being sold. So I guess I would want to protect that. Yeah. So. Yeah. So then the license you would end up choosing for your travel photography of Hawaii would be the, the by NCSA, the um, attribution non-commercial share alike. Um, and you can go through this process on your own. We actually have, um, so these are the four conditions. Um, and depending on your needs, whether you're you, uh, trying to share travel photography or an education curriculum or uh, a blog post, you would go through that process of choosing and we actually have a license chooser tool that you can go through. So if you go to creativecommons.org slash choose, you'll see you'll come to this screen and it asks you if you want to allow adaptations of your work and then you say yes or no. Um, and if you want others to share alike uh, if they do um, make ad adaptations of your work, you would click yes as long as others share alike. Um, and then in Alan's case he said no to commercial uses. So here you, you end up with the attribution on commercial share like condition. And it, it actually spits out code for you to put it on your website if you want to put the photo online. Um, but you can see how this might um, result in different licenses because depending on your needs. So we actually have a great exercise that you can go through on your own It's as part of the Get Creative Commons Savvy course at the School of Open. And I don't know if we want to paste a link into this into the chat, Paul. I'll paste it into the Hangout chat. But you can see here that um, it takes you through three different scenarios where you pretend you're an obscure musician or an elementary school teacher or an amateur photographer as we just did with Alan. And you can see why there might be different um, licenses chosen for your specific um, intent to share. That's great. Uh, really helpful exercise. Thank you, Jane. Uh, I heard you um, reference um, educational, open educational resources, or perhaps it was Josie who, who brought up that term. And uh, I have to say, I often hear um, Creative Commons, uh, and I think perhaps even in your intro, Jane, you, uh, you mentioned open educational resources uh, alongside uh, this idea of licensing with Creative Commons. Um, and I think that's uh, those two uh, phrases are often articulated together, and I'm wondering what what really is the connection between Creative Commons and open educational resources. And I think for for many in our audience, it would be helpful to even have defined what an open educational resource uh, signifies. Yeah, sure. Um, 
so Creative Commons abides by the Hewlett definition of open educational resources, which um, actually, let me just pop it up on my screen again so that you can read it as, as well. Um, so this is a Hewlett definition. Hewlett, by the way, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation is a huge funder of open educational resources, if not the original funder behind the, the movement. Um, and they define OER as teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain, so free for anyone to use for any purpose whatsoever, or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. So by that definition, um, Creative Commons licenses really sort of provide the legal framework for OER. Um, if it weren't for the Creative Commons licenses, you wouldn't be able to legally uh, reuse and repurpose other people's work. You would have to hire a lawyer or become a lawyer yourself or just become ex an expert in legal language to draft your own license every time you wanted to um, create a sharing contract between two parties. And that's why Creative Commons developed its licenses so that you wouldn't have to do that as an educator as a scientist or as an institution, you can just use our standard licenses to slap it onto your work and that signifies to the user exactly how they can and can't share the work. Um, and so OER, these are the two we think the most important components of OER, the fact that they are free to use, which means to access the resource, but also the, the fact that they are free to remix it. So in the case of Alan's travel photography, he, because he put it under a license that allowed remix and that allowed free reuse as long as they gave him credit, that photograph would qualify as an open educational resource. However, if he had decided that, oh, I don't want people to make different versions of it, um, black and white versions, I'm going to add the no derivatives condition, that photo would not really qualify as an open educational resource because a lot of um, education is about building on what came before and adapting um, resources to local context, translating that resource to different languages, um, and stuff like that. So this is kind of the graphic we tend to show at conferences. You can see that these are different organizations and institutions that have put out educational resources under Creative Commons licenses, and there are plenty more where that com came from. But all these organizations um, allow people to not only freely access that resource, but to remix and, re and build upon it, as long as they give credit to the creator and maybe not use it commercially. But some of them do allow commercial uses as well. Great, Jane. And um, actually, we have a question um, from the chat uh, having to do with, uh, say, for instance, if you're presenting and you do want to share, but you don't want to share all of the assets in the presentation, like, say, for instance, a couple of the photos, um, how would you go about um, licensing something like that? So in that case, I would just mark each of the photos separately. Um, most people have the opposite um, situation where they want to share the entire presentation under a Creative Commons license, but they have to they want to note that some of the photos they got from third party sources that aren't necessarily under that Creative Commons license. And in that case I would mark the photos separately. I usually include a slide at the end where I attribute um, all of the different sources from where I got the photos. So for example, the um, remember the fuzzy copyright photo, this one, this is actually not under um, a Creative Commons attribution license, which is the license that we use for all Creative Commons presentations, and I usually um, provide a link to the original Flickr pages, which is right here, and you can see that the user here used an attribution non-commercial license, so I would note that in the slide or at the end of the presentation somewhere so that people could access the original resource under the original license terms. Great. Um, well, I think because of the, the technical glitch that we had, we are rapidly coming, and I would say too rapidly coming to the end of this conversation. Um, so I want to make sure that I gave uh, everyone who was here uh, a chance to add some final thoughts, to articulate some final thoughts uh, before we have to close. Um, and I'm going to go from right to left this time. So Josie, would you like to start? Do you have any final thoughts before we um, sign off? Yeah, I'd just say, um, obviously, thank you ever so much for inviting me to come and talk today. I've really enjoyed it. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure. Um, Creative Commons will continue to be a really important part of the work that we do and the process that we um, are taking here in terms of um, open education and also in supporting learners in becoming connected to each other. So, we've, um, so thanks very much, Creative Commons. 
for all your hard work in making it easy for educators to be able to use um, your licensing. And I would just also um, give a shout out to one of our projects that went live uh, early this month, um, which was uh, a project work with three of our special education schools that we work with Childnet International to produce guidance for educators who are working with learners on the autistic spectrum and uh, it's e-safety guidance to support the positive educational experience of young people who are on the autistic spectrum. We licensed that with Creative Commons, it was one of the first things that I think Childnet have put out under Creative Commons license um, and it had 2,000 downloads in the first 24 hours that it was out. Um, so we feel that it's a very, very powerful way to support our educators and to support educators globally as well. Thanks, Josie. In fact, if you could uh, share the link here in the Hangout chat, then we'll we'll uh, add that to the um, to the get it, uh, or you could do that as well. Uh, Jane, why don't I come back to you last? Um, so, going, continuing, moving from right to left, um, Carol, who joined us uh, a little bit late. Um, okay. Uh, well, my my background is um, library and information science, and I actually teach about these topics. So I would uh, give a pitch uh, for including um, a clear definition of your social media and digital media policy for um, to guide student behavior and staff behavior online. And if you don't have a policy, you know, then you need to have that conversation and, and uh, have that posted in um, you know uh, accessible places. So everybody's on the same page and they kind of know you know what their framework is and what their platform is, and you know you can just add to that traditional uh, training about citing properly. And um, uh, that last page that was mentioned on the PowerPoint of the attribution that is essential, you know, for for students to understand when they do a larger work or whatever. But they they must include that list of resources used, however they cite them or attribute them. So that's it. Thank Great, you. thank you, Carol. And how about you, Alan? Do you have a final thought or thoughts? Uh, yeah. Um, so I think copyright and fair use is one of the most important issues of our day. Um, and I, I think it not only should be openly discussed in classrooms, it should be taught in classrooms. And uh, I think Creative Commons and OER are great innovators in that area and great resources for us as an organization should be great resources for schools and teachers and students as well. Thanks, Alan. And Jane? Uh, yeah, actually, I wanted to highlight, um, if you want to learn more about anything that we've discussed today, especially about copyright and fair use and Creative Commons and OER and how they all play together, I would encourage you to visit the schoolofopen.org, which I pasted a link into the chat, but also share um, our new website, because it's so, it's so nice, um, that we recently launched in the screen share. Um, this is essentially an initiative that Creative Commons manages with the Peer-to-Peer -peer University. It's a free online initiative where you can access free uh, resources um, that where you can learn more about Creative Commons licenses, copyright, etc. So you can see that we have a bunch of free online courses, and a lot of them have to do with cop called Copyright for Educators, um, Copyright for Librarians, Creative Commons for K-12 Educators, um, and whatnot. And so it's a, it's a great place for you to go after this hangout. Great, thanks, Jane. Uh, so before I thank all the guests, I just want to say quickly too that when I think of Creative Commons and I think of uh, open educational resources, I I think not just about the um, practices that um, we all are engaging in, particularly those of us who are educators uh, with our young people, but I think of of uh, this uh, more general movement towards uh, an an open um, and free and shareable um, web and web-based culture. And I think uh, that is one of the things that is so appealing to me about uh, thinking about Creative Commons and open educational resources, is um, essentially being part of this movement. Uh, so I appreciate all of you who are um, at the forefront of, of this movement right at the moment, and uh, let's bring more people on board. Um, so just to close out, I would uh, just like to thank all of you for joining this webinar. I really appreciate your thoughts and insights into this really critical topic. Um, and for the audience, if you're interested in learning more about um, connected learning, which uh, is at the heart of all the work that happens here at Educator Innovator, make sure to check out the Connected Learning Alliance site at clalliance.org. 
where there are amazing testimonials from practitioners and informative multimedia pieces. Uh, if you'd like to keep on top of future opportunities at Educator Innovator, um, please, uh, and uh, opportunities from partners like Creative Commons, um, please sign up for our monthly newsletter at uh, educatorinnovator.org and follow Educator Innovator at um, innovates underscore ed on Twitter. Finally, uh, visit makesummer.org, part of the summer to make, play, and connect to find more opportunities like this one um, from a range of organizations, Cities of Learning, Mozilla's Maker Party, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, spend your summer making, playing, and connecting. So thanks again, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Josie and Alan and Carol for joining. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye, everyone. And thanks, Paul, for hosting. <laughs> sure. Pleasure. Bye.